Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is uh, Matthew Schmaltz, and I'm professor of religious studies here at Holy Cross. And I'm particularly honored and privileged to introduce Rafael Luciani, a leading Latin American theologian, to speak on, quote, a new way of being church, Latin American roots of Pope Francis's reforms. And today's lecture is sponsored by the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture, and it's being recorded and should be available online in a few days at holycross.edu backslash McFarland Center. Also, the library has prepared resource materials related to the lecture. So if you'd like to learn more about Pope Francis and Latin American theology, please pick up a handout, and the handouts are over there, and check out the book display at the library. Rafael Luciani is Professor Extraordinarius at the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry and coordinator of the Ibero-American Theology Project. He has been professor at the Jesuits Catholic University, Andres Bello, in Caracas, where he directed the School of Theology at the Pontifical Salesian University in Rome. He is also senior advisor to CELAM, the Conference of Latin American Bishops. Professor Luciani is author of Francis and the Theology of the People, a winner of the, 19, of the 2018 Catholic Press Association Book Award. A Venezuelan native, he has published a number of Spanish language books and articles on systematic theology, Christology, Latin American theology, Vatican II, and Pope Francis. He recently returned from the Pan-Amazon Synod and offers a fresh perspective on how Pope Francis's vision for the ecologically fragile region is shaped by the theology of the people. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rafael Luciani. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for being here and especially for your interest in uh, knowing more about the Latin American roots of Francis to understand the process that we're living in the church as a transition um, that uh, will lead to a reform. So to give you an idea of what we're going to be talking about, I put uh, five points and an introduction. Uh, that will frame uh, the basic concepts of Francis uh, related to Latin American theology and way of being church there, and how this affects uh, the reception of the Second Vatican Council in his pontificate, and then from there we can understand why he has brought a lot of uh, a confrontation, sometimes opposition or indifference, uh, according to the different uh, places in, in the churches, local churches in the world. So first, we're going to see the roots of Francis's ecclesiological framework, just some ideas that we will be developing throughout the lecture and will help us frame at least some of the concepts. Then we're going to see reform and conversion, two words that cannot be separated under Francis. When we speak about reform, we uh, hear continuously, for example, pastoral conversion, conversion, synodal conversion against conversion, ecological conversion, ministerial conversion. So reform and conversion go together in the Francis's way of understanding the current process in the church. Then a theology, pastoral conversion, and then a theology of the people, census fide, people in Spanish, pueblo, is very different than people in English, especially in the US. Because normally, uh, when we say people here, it's about um, middle class or working people, but in Latin America, people, pueblo, has to do, at least in the imaginary, with uh, poor people and collective subject. I uh, want to see more about that. Then the synodal way of proceeding, proceeding, that means the new path that is being opened by Francis. And the big challenge, of course, of all of this is to change the mentality and therefore the ecclesial culture. Because we're living in different ways of being church together. And we can say without being afraid, afraid of uh, affirming it that we have several types of Catholicisms that not all are Christians. That means not all follow Jesus' praxis. So we're going to see a little bit about uh, this. So just briefly to, to begin, 
and frame uh, some of the sources of Francis's ecclesiology. First, Lumen Gentius' theology of the people of God received in Evangelii Gaudium, his exhortation uh, when he began the pontificate. The people of God is incarnate in the peoples of the earth. This is a text from Evangelii Gaudium that helps to connect with Vatican II's uh, Council Lumen Gentium. And the people of God in the midst of the peoples of the earth. So you don't have a church separated from, and therefore salvation cannot be understood uh, outside the uh, society, the historicity, the world, what we do. And this frame of um, ecclesiological uh, way of understanding our appurtenance to the church means that we cannot uh, be Christians without being engaging every day in our quotidian life with the people. So again, the word people related to the people of God has to do with the word people as we related in a society. A second frame is the missionary discipleship concept that appears in Aparecida, which is the fifth Latin American bishops conference where Francis was the, um, the uh, director of the concluding draft document commission. Then, another idea that we're going to be talking about is the connection between popular religiosity and sensus fide, how God uh, speaks through the people. And this uh, speaks through the people is a real um, interesting concept uh, for us today to begin a process of conversion. If we believe that it's really speaking through the people, through each one of us, or he has already spoken, we don't have nothing more to listen to and to find more in history about it, about God. Another source is Arrupe's notion of inculturation, which is a, uh, the word inculturación in Spanish is a neologism. It's a word created by Arrupe in terms of what it means related to evangelization. Uh, it's about uh, getting uh, ourselves involved, engaged as one of a, a community, or one more in a community. And that means to assume the lifestyles of a community. So inculturation was for uh, Bergoglio in this Congress in 1985, a key concept related to evangelization, for example. Another concept is the church, which is poor, this famous phrase that he said uh, beginning his pontificate to the media. Church that is poor was referring to the structures of the church, and then he said for the poor, the mission of the church. So you cannot, from the beginning of, of his pontificate, separate the reform of the structures with the light of the option for the poor and the mission of the church with the light, the same light uh, for the option of the poor. And finally, this is a speech that he recently gave um, on October in Rome, uh, celebrating the 40th anniversary of uh, Puebla, which is um, the, another of the conferences of the Latin American Episcopate. And in this speech that you can find uh, in the Vatican website, it's very interesting because he draws his own reception from Latin American ecclesial life and theology uh, of the council. And he refers there to the council. Then he refers to Evangelii Nunciandi, Paul VI. He also refers to the Conference of Puebla and Amparecida. And he says that from there he takes the ecclesiology of the people of God that appears in Puebla. And he jumps. Santo Domingo, which was a conference in 1992 that, as he says in the text, was intervened by Rome in that moment. And at the end was a text that has not had so much of a good reception among Latin Americans. So he frankly, a pope, imagine saying that I, I am in this line of reception, Puebla and Aparecida, and he jumps a document of the Latin American church. That's interesting to hear from a pope. No? And then Gustavo Gutierrez was sitting there because they were coming out of the Congress of the 40th anniversary of Puebla. And he said to Gustavo, looking at him, 
that he had contributed to the mission, the prophetic mission of the church uh, in the world. So imagine a pope also recognizing the figure that founded liberation theology in the sense of being a prophetic voice that moved forward, he said, the church, that pushed the church to move forward. So let's start with the first um, uh, uh, concepts, reform and conversion. And as I was telling you, every time you hear reform, it has to be linked with conversion. Because it's not a reform of a corporation that we can change the ways of working and the people that are in, in an office and everything will uh, come good out, out of that. So one of the texts that is very important uh, to understand uh, what he means of the reform, it's what he says about here in this um, um, that you have there, uh, Ecclesia Semper Reformanda. He says this on November 9th, 2013, in a homily. We cannot understand Francis only by reading exhortations or encyclicals uh, that he has published. We have to uh, see him as a whole uh, event which implies gestures, words, documents, many things, and we have to put all that together to understand what he's uh, trying to bring about. So one of the principles, of re which is the principle of reformability, was said in this homily at Santa Maria. Ecclesia semper reformanda, says Francis. The church always needs to be renewing her since her members are sinners and continually need to be converted. Now we have a problem here because the English text, if you see, doesn't say reform. Renew. Renew and not uh, reform. The Spanish text says reform. And this happens with many of his texts. What happens if I say renewal? Well, it's not a change. It's simply painting the walls. And reform is a radical change, which means what in uh, many documents of Latin America that we will see uh, shortly says that we have to pass from a pastoral, for example, of conservation, where uh, everything is centered in, yeah, around liturgy, for example, and catechism, towards a pastoral that faces the world uh, engaged in it. That means that that would change, for example, the face of what we have in our mind of a parish. And this is also interesting because in the U.S., parishes, Catholic parishes, are only about uh, masses and catechisms, the average Catholic parishes. In Latin America, parishes are that, but overall engaging with the community. So in a parish here in the U.S., when you go to a, a Protestant parish, you find that engagement very visible. When you go to a Catholic parish, you don't find it. And this was for me, um, when I came here um, uh, three and a half years ago, very uh, shocking because uh, the model of the parish shows you how a church is vivid or not in terms of the engagement with the community, with the society. So it's not renewal, it's reform. It's a radical change uh, of a structure which embodies uh, the church through parishes, etc. In other texts, it's uh, what you have there, Evangelii Gaudium number 26. It says, the Second Vatican Council presented ecclesial conversion as openness to a constant self-renewal born of fidelity to Jesus Christ. Again, self-renewal. The Spanish original text says, permanent reform not self-renewal. We may say, well, uh, we have in every language ways of expressing, well, precisely ways of expressing that do not express the radicality of what he, in his pontificate, is trying to uh, say or to show. So reform 
is to be understood in uh, two ways, he says, says Francis on November 22nd of 2016. He says, first, conform to the good news which must be proclaimed joyously and courageously to all, especially to the poor, the least, and the outcast. That's the first uh, way to understand uh, the reform. That means that a structure and a mentality that we have that is not conform to the proclamation of this good news to the poor, to the least, to the outcast, is not uh, the way in which the reform is understood. That means, again, I can change the structure, the building, I can change the people working there, but again, that can be a structure that has nothing to do with the society and the problems and the needs of the people. And the second, he says, at the same time, this means conforming the curia in Rome ever more fully to its purpose, which is that of cooperating in the ministry of the successor of Peter. And this is um, uh, when he quotes that text, uh, when he says that text, he quotes uh, this motu proprio, and he says, to may better meet the needs, the needs of the men and women whom they are called to serve. Not to better meet, meet the needs of the pope or of the bishops or of the curia itself. Again, the eye is put on the poor, on the least, on the outcast. Therefore, in Evangelii Gaudium 27, he starts to uh, give us an overview of uh, the uh, reform, and he says the following. I dream of a missionary option capable of transforming everything so that the church customs, ways of doing things, styles, times, schedules, language, and structures can be appropriate channels for the evangelization today for today's world, rather than for her self-preservation. This is very strong, and at the same time, it's very concrete. It touches lifestyles, schedules, times, ways of doing things, customs. We are accustomed to do things because we have been doing it for so many years, and we have not questioned why should we continue to do that in the same way. So it's a text that is very uh, strong in terms of a call to reform. Very concrete things that create an ambience in the church. And then he says, the renewal of the structures demanded by pastoral conversion can only be understood in this light. To make the structures more mission-oriented, to make ordinary pastoral activity on every level more inclusive and open, to inspire in all pastoral workers an attitude of constant going forth, church in exit. To make the structures more mission-oriented, not um, precisely um, uh, self-oriented towards its own way of working and its self-functioning and its self-managerial uh, way of being. This is what he calls the church in exit. So going to the peripheries changes the center. That's the logic. But if I don't risk and go to the peripheries, the center will never change. So the reform is a process, and it's what he's saying, an ongoing personal mentalities and a structural church structures process of conversion. So it's not a reform only, like I reform again, and this is important to repeat, it's not a corporation that we're reforming. It's not a business office that we're reforming. If it doesn't imply the mentality, personal conversion, and the structure, structural conversion, then this is not an ecclesial reform. Then the reform, he says, of the Curia is, no, is in no way implemented with a change of persons. This may sound uh, naive. Because many people uh, tell me every time, well, wh the Pope uh, in, is a, a monarch. The church is a monarchy, practically. So he could, from one day to another, simply change everybody and would have no opposition. In 2060, he said this. It's not simply 
or implemented with a change of persons, and then at the end he says, without a change of mentality, efforts at practical improvement will be in vain. So I can put someone in that office that right now may be uh, publicly in favor of me, but the mentality didn't change, and in four, five, six years, I'm going to have the same structure working in the same direction. So he was very clear that it's not simply a problem of changing people from offices. An important source that can help us to contextualize the meaning of these two dimensions, personal and structural, is the conference of Medellin in 1968, the second conference of Latin American bishops. And in Medellin, in a document about peace, um, the bishops say the following. Continuous change of structures transformation of attitudes and conversion of hearts. Three things that may help us to uh, imagine what a reform is. Change of a structures. That means that we have structures that are obsolete, that are not anymore needed according to the mission of the church today. Then the second, transformation of attitudes. What he was saying before about people or changing people simply, but I have the same mentality or the same uh, structure as before. And third, conversion of hearts. That means um, what he has always been referring, for example, to mercy, compassion. So it's not only about knowing how to deal better with a structure. It has to do also with the attitude, with the way of living, with the following of Jesus. Personal renewal, says in another document of Medellin, implies a process of continuous mental aggiornamento understood for two, from two perspectives. First, theological pastoral based on the council documents and current theology, and second, pedagogical resulting from an ongoing dialogue supported by group dynamics and constant review of different forms of pastoral actions. This is a very Latin American way of understanding the reception of the council in our countries. You have first the emphasis, as the document of Medellin is saying here, on the council documents and current theology. But then you have this second element that is not uh, normal to see in many local churches in the world. What we call uh, uh, to work together, or the name of this document, Pastoral en Conjunto, is born of a, in a book uh, that was published in Salem with that name, to organize the way in which local churches among them were going to work and, and imagine uh, that that work was going to be done together. So when we speak about the Latin American church, we have to speak about always working together as churches in their diversity, in their different contexts. But it's not only then about simply one church imagining and figuring out its own pastoral for its own reality without any interaction with the other local churches. That is something unique in the world in terms of church models. So without that, we cannot understand Francis's uh, way of, um, uh, for example, his vision of uh, in expanding the church to a world church because this diversity, this way of being uh, together has to do with a way of being church also in Latin America. Among the realities, um, uh, last quote of this document of Pastoral de Conjunto, we view negatively are the following. First, the inadequacy of the traditional structures of many parishes in providing a true community experience. Isn't that what we're living today? This is written in 1968. This has been said by Francis so many times in different words and expressions. Second, a quite generalized impression that diocesan and curias are administrative bureaucracies. Third, the distress of many priests at not finding decisive, decisive solutions to some priestly crisis. 
Four, individualistic attitudes. Five, cases where collaborative ministry or planning has been poorly practiced. And then if we have improvisation, technical incompetence, excessive evaluation of plans, etc., etc., etc. This diagnosis, 1968, today's Francis's diagnosis, 2019, coincide perfectly with more things even today that we can add. A second um, concept that arises from that, uh, that we have uh, explained until now is this notion of pastoral conversion. It's, in my experience, the notion that it's more uh, complicated to un understand outside Latin America. To give you an example, normally people understand pastoral as different from theology or pastoral as something that it's done by the church externally, like uh, those who are in ministry, those who are in a parish. So it's, all, it's seen all around a, a very practical a, a activity. In Latin America, when we use the word pastoral and we use it together with theology, we use a theology, theological pastoral. It comes together. In the many documents of Ceylon, these two words are together. We have a, a team of uh, theologians at Ceylon, and the team is called the team of theological have pastoral. It doesn't say theology experts or pastoral experts. So we cannot separate when we're saying a pastoral conversion as something different from theology. So, for example, in uh, conversion has to do with change, as we saw and reform. But if I say pastoral conversion, it's saying like I cannot reform or convert without that connection and living with the people. So it's not an accessory. It's not something I do after I think theologically. If it's not integrated, then it doesn't work. Because it's not that I'm converting to do pastoral activities. It's that I convert in and within the process and within the relationship in a community, and therefore pastoral becomes the place where I do theology. And theology becomes the expression of that pastorality in which I live and embraces my whole life. So the call for permanent pastoral conversion, not punctual, permanent pastoral conversion, appears, and this is interesting because it's maybe the only text that uh, Francis uh, takes from Santo Domingo, the conference that I told you about that was not well received in Latin America because as he said in the speech that I quoted before, it was a conference intervened by Rome. But there is a key concept there that he takes and is precisely pastoral conversion, a concept that comes from Santo Domingo. And uh, this concept um, presupposes in uh, another document that can be used to explain it, loving the people, getting close to them and understand them, trusting in their creative abilities and their power to bring about change, helping them to express themselves and organize, listening to them, not in an understanding their views even though they respond to cultures on a different level. We must learn to understand their joys and hopes, anxieties and sufferings, learn especially what they want. That's all about pastoral conversion. That's all about the reception of the council in Latin America. So without this frame, how can we understand pastoral conversion if it implies our own involvement as theologians, as professionals, as uh, people from any career and experience that we may have engaging with a community of people, with the people? as part of the people, not as an outsider that knows more. 
Victor Manuel Fra Fernandez is, uh, as you know, one of the um, most um, closest uh, persons to Francis who wrote part of Evangelii Gaudium. And he explains the following, we find in the poor some deeply Christian values, a spontaneous interests in others, an ability to devote time to others and to come to the aid of a neighbor without continuing, counting the time or the effort required. That's a whole attitude to have. That's pastoral conversion. That's an example of what um, Medellin, I quoted before, this change of attitudes and change of heart. If I am not able to live in this way my daily relationships, pastoral conversion, uh, to say it simply, doesn't work. Because it's not, again, about changing a simple structure like in, if you were in a corporation. Lucio Hera, one of the, uh, uh, the founder of Theology of the People in, in Argentina, says also uh, the following. The church can choose not to turn to the poor, or it can do so from outside with an attitude of service, whether self-interested or not. It works for the poor, uh, still among, more among them, and even with some of them. But then he says, but nevertheless, at least in a spirit, this is not theirs. That's what we call assistentialism. A church or people uh, in our communities that think that just by giving things to the poor, that makes a church poor and for the poor. So if pastoral conversion is presupposed in the option for the poor, if I do not become friends of poor people, how can I talk about pastoral conversion? Gutierrez has this expression, no? To become friends of the poor. One thing is to know poor people, to help poor people. But do I have friends that are poor? That's the key of pastoral conversion. A, a, a very close friend of a uh, first generation theologians, a Venezuelan theolo theologian, Pedro Trigo, used to say, uh, when we teach together, he used to say, you know that you have a, a friend that is poor when you go to his or her house and the things that uh, this person takes out for you are the same things that they use daily. But if they take you nice plates, and very nice glasses and all the best things they have is because they are not still your friends. And that's true. When you go to someone's house and you are treated especially, that means that you have still have some kind of distance. So this is what Gutierrez, this is what Trigo is trying to say. This is pastoral conversion again. Another text that can help us to understand uh, pastoral conversion is said by Francis in, a trip, in his trip to Bolivia. He says the following, this rudeness, is a word very uh, used uh, by him in many speeches, this rudeness in the barrio, the land, the office, the labor union, this ability to see yourself in the faces of others, daily proximity to their share of troubles, daily proximity. It's not that I go one week to see how uh, poor people live and then I return to my life the rest of the year and then I don't see um, them anymore. Daily proximity. And he uses this beautiful expression, a genuine interpersonal encounter. The culture of encounter. The culture of uh, what we have been uh, hearing many, many, many times in the media, building bridges, is about this. Um, another Argentinian theologian who is uh, uh, one of the, um, um, that developed more the concept of popul pa popular pastoral, uh, pastoral with the people, says the following, the church works for the poor, even more among them, with some of them, it is a good mode, but it does not take their own mode, the own mode, which is a specific of what would be a church of the incarnate world. 
their own mode. I'm not taking my mode of being to the poor so that they can be what I am. So pastoral conversion, again, is not that I go to a place and take the way in which I think the church should be there, but how do I find there the way in which they live and that way is the starting point to be church, to be community. So this is the second uh, part, pastoral conversion and reform. A third is a theology of the people of God or a census fide, as I'm going to explain. And when we use the word people, as I said before, pueblo means very different in Latin America than when we may use it in other contexts. So pueblo has to do with this notion first of a common subject. Therefore, if my culture is individualistic, I cannot understand the word pueblo because it's a common subject. So when we say pueblo de Dios in the council, it is received culturally as a common subject and not as individuals living there and conforming a pueblo. So the same word is received culturally differently. So that's why it is so important to understand it. So uh, Victor Manuel Fra Fernandez, whom I referred before, says uh, the census fidelium, the sense of the people, could be, this, could be them, some of the individuals that believe the same truth, but the census populi, the sense of the people, in terms of this people, pueblo, common, has a communal subject, the people. This is one of the key uh, to understand this word. Um, one uh, phrase that is used a lot in the US, and I really don't like it, is when someone says, it is what it is, or let me my space. Those are expressions of a very individualistic way of being. So it's like I can separate at some point myself from the other, and therefore relationship is not inherent, intrinsic and permanent. In the word people, as in the text that we have some, uh, read before, we're talking about something that is intrinsic to our way of being. I cannot be without the other. I do not understand myself without and separate from the other. And the other is part of me and I am the, in the relationship in which I live with the other. I'm not outside that relationship because I am relationship. I do not have relationships. So it's another way of completely of understanding uh, and therefore another reception of the council uh, culturally different. Francis says in Ecuador the following, God's faithful people, another expression he likes to use a lot, faithful people, the people who express the faith in their own language. And they show their deepest feelings of sadness, uncertainty, joy, failure, and thanksgiving in various devotions, processions, votive lights, flowers, hymns, etc. Express the faith in their own language. That phrase is really a, a phrase that should put us into a lot of thinking. How many um, things do we express of our faith that do not connect with our languages? So what Francis is using here, popular religiosity as an example, is to say that there is a connection there between what they believe and the way they express it. So imagine today, no? we, have we find all the ways in which we can express our faith in the different contexts and people in our communities. So uh, young people, you have uh, then the same thing. Have you found, find a way in which in your language you express your faith and not in the language that I or other person have? That's the symbolic idea of uh, why Francis uses popular religiosity. He's not telling us that um, we have to go uh, here to Ecuador, or we have to go to Venezuela, or we have to go to 
uh, El Salvador to see popular religiosity, and there we have the true values. What he's saying is that what happens there, what is being lived there, this connection between my daily life, sadness, fears, etc., with the way in which I express my faith has to occur in every culture. So we have to find the language, the ways, the connections. And in Paraguay, he said the following. The same way that we listen to our Father is the way we listen to God's faithful people. This is all uh, Vatican Second Council. The same way. So do we believe that when we listen to the people, we are listening the voice of God through the people? That's pure Vatican Second Council. So in this sense, Francis, a son of the council, is putting into, trying to put into practice the spirit of the council. Another um, uh, way to understand uh, this is connecting it with the council in Lumen Gentium 9, where um, uh, he quotes in Evangelii Gaudium 113 and the following. God has chosen to call human beings as a people and not as isolated individuals. That's uh, uh, powerful. It's not a, as isolated individuals. So the word people implies this relational, communal, communitarian notion in which we realize ourselves as persons. And then he says, God attracts us by taking into account the complex interweaving, interweaving of personal relationships entailed in the life of a human community. It's not an individual call. Oh, God is calling me and not you. It's in the interweaving of personal relationships entailing the life of a human community. So there is not a private, to say uh, in a way, a private relationship between God and I, and I and God, etc. It's always mediated through a community because we are the relationship in which we live. We do not have individual relationships. So it's a problem of understanding how do we think uh, our own selves. No? In Evangelii Gaudium 178, he says this, much more harder. Our redemption has a social dimension because God in Christ redeems not only the individual person but also the social relations existing between human beings. This Spanish meaning implies that the two, the personal and the social, go together. If I read the English translation like, well, he saved the individual person and also the social relations, that's not the meaning of the text. Because throughout uh, the text and the many texts here and the speeches that we have seen and many uh, that we haven't, it's not about individuals isolated we are the relationship in which we, we live. So this salvation, redemption, all these concepts imply social relationships existing between human beings. Uh, this theology and then of the people of God listening to the other and believing that God speaks through the other takes us, leads us to what he calls, uh, opens a way of a synodal church, synodality. This is also a new word and, uh, for many people, and it implies a deepening, a moving forward of the council, a deepening of the council's spirit. On October 17, 2050, uh, 15, in the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the institution of the Synod of Bishops, Francis says uh, what you can read uh, there. 
First, the path of synodality, says Francis, is the path that God, God expects from the church of the third millennium. What the Lord asks us, in a certain sense, is already contained in the word synod, walking together, lay people, pastors, bishops of Rome, etc. So he's putting synodality as the way in which the church in the third millennium should be should proceed, uh, should form and reform and conform itself. And then he says a synodal church is a listening church with the awareness that listening is, is more than hearing. It is a reciprocal listening in which everyone has something to learn. Faithful people, Episcopal College, Bishop of Rome, one listening to the others and one listening to the Holy Spirit. Faithful people, we saw that in the speeches before. Faithful people, that means all of us, including bishops, including the Bishop of Rome, all of us are faithful people. Then he says, Episcopal College, the second subject, the bishops. And then he said, the Bishop of Rome. He doesn't say here, the Pope. A bishop among the bishops in the synod, uh, right now in October, uh, Pope Francis was uh, voting like a bishop, not like a pope, because he cannot, as a pope, participate uh, talking and voting in a synod. So one of the things he said is, I am here like a synodal father, like another bishop. I'm not here like the pope saying, and everybody has to be afraid because I take a position, and everybody has to follow that position because I'm the pope. That's what it's synodality about. So faithful people implies not only the lay people, but also bishops and the pope. It's a concept that implies every person in the church. And then he says, one listening to the others and all listening to the Holy Spirit. That means what uh, we were saying before. Do we believe that God is speaking through the people or uh, not. Synodality then implies, as we have seen uh, in the former slides, changing lifestyles, la remember languages, ways of uh, speaking, customs, etc. Practices of discernment. Do I listen? Do I believe that by listening, I'm listening God in the presence of the other? Do I discern listening, what I listen, or simply hear and not listen? Practices of discernment. And then structures of governance. The three things, structures, ways in which our church structures are um, posed uh, and work. So synodality is a way of proceeding a way of being, not something that we're adding up to make the church nicer or the church with a, a, a fresh face. It's a way of proceeding. It defines what the church is and should be. That's why the um, document of the Theological International Commission about synodality, defines synodality as constitutive, not simply a way of acting, constitutive, a way of being, a way of living, says the document. Interesting that uh, I always ask uh, in, um, uh, to professors of theology if they have read that document, and the majority that I have asked uh, don't know that a document exists because that's something that has to put us into thinking because it has to do with the way of being church, with the way of understanding the uh, reform and therefore the church. So it's a new way of proceeding. Some examples, two dimensions, the discernment and the interpretation proper to the Episcopal College assembled together and the conspiracy of all members of the people of God. They have to go together. Imagine the bishops 
taking a decision without, without any other faithful people in the church. That's not a church, assembly. Church means assembly, congregation. That means that it's not about one people taking a decision to the rest um, for the rest of the people. So synodality involves this dynamic in which I am a member of the people of God as the others are members of the people of God. So what defines all of us together are being people of God all. Lay people, bishops, the Pope, and that generates a dynamic and interaction and relationships uh, and therefore a way of proceeding. Another idea, an effort to maintain the conciliar dynamic among the one, the Pope, the many, the bishops, and all the people. In, we tend to um, ask for a less authoritarian a structure, in any structure that we live, but at the same time we don't want to integrate the voices that we don't like to hear. So it's a contradiction. So what Francis is trying to uh, bring about, and this is really interesting, is that he understands that listening will bring some change even if we may not be agreeing of what we are listening to. Uh, something happened in the Synod, as you know, that uh, the expectation around uh, women deacons were very high. And in the document, uh, the concluding document, the Synodal Fathers say that the majority of the Synodal Fathers approve the women and they would like the women to be deacons, etc. The next day, Francis immediately said, I catch the globe. So I take that word, that phrase, and he's called for a commission to uh, study not the origins of uh, deacons uh, in the church, but the possibility of figuring out a ministry of deacons for women. So again, this is a way of proceeding. He listens and he may not be in the moment agreeing with that, but he opens himself to the possibility of doing that or studying that or discerning that. In former popes, we have seen documents that say that we cannot speak about certain topic and that's it. And those of us who have studied in faculties of theology for years could not speak about certain topics. So the way of proceeding of Francis, again, is different. I may not agree, but I am open to that's a way of proceeding. An inverted pyramid is another image to understand synodality. Articulating the people of God the Episcopal College and the successor of Peter in that very specific order. In that very specific order. First, the people of God, all of us, including the bishops and the Pope. Second, the bishops, collegiality, some, etc. And finally, the bishop of Rome, primacy, the one. So that's the, the inverted pyramid is in the council uh, used in one of the speeches uh, of one of the um, uh, bishops, the Schmidt, to say that by inverting the pyramid and putting first all of us as people of God, we can avoid clericalism, he says. A word that Francis takes from there. And then he starts to um, uh, say the uh, um, hierarchalism, papolatrism, etc. Many words that can come if we do not invert the pyramid. So finally, synodality is an organic and a structuring concept of ecclesial life. It's a principle of ecclesiogenesis. That means that affects everything, lifestyles, exercises of authority and power, ecclesial models. 
And these three things, lifestyles, exercises of authority and power, and ecclesial models, are the three ideas that appear in Santo Domingo when the document speaks for the first time about pastoral conversion. So the concept of pastoral conversion, according to Santo Domingo, and then taken by Aparecida, implies the discernment and the reform of relationships of authority and power. So it's not a concept of merely changing the pastoral uh, ministerial way of acting in a parish. It's the whole relationships of authority and power, lifestyles, ecclesial models in the church. Uh, to, to end, it's important to understand that what Francis is trying to do is not to bring a Latin American church to the world church. The way in which he understands what the current process of the reform uh, should bring to the church has, let's say, two sides. No? Pastoral conversion and synodal conversion. Pastoral conversion, what we have seen, the Latin American roots. But synodal conversion is the deepening of the Spirit's Council as a world church. So pastoral conversion means starting from the base, being one of the people. But I cannot do then a synodal conversion if I am not situated in this pastoral conversion. So they both have to go together. So the reform is understood as pastoral conversion and as synodal conversion, because it implies ways of proceeding, structure, relationship, authority, power, etc., etc. Synodality, which is a constitutive, says Gilles Routier in Ecclesiology of, um, uh, in Canada, uh, which is a constitutive dimension of the church and belongs to its very nature, appeals to the practices, the institutional figures, and the procedures that allow it to be carried out. And then at the end he says, there are three actions or practices that concretely describe what dialogue is. Expressing an opinion, first. Listening, second. Taking advice, three. If I cannot express an opinion, even if it's not well received, how can I listen? Second step, I'm not listening because I'm not free to speak. Taking advice, how can I take advice again if I'm not able to express an opinion and to listen? So the three have to go together. That's how a way of proceeding works when we speak about synodality. And then, uh, in the second uh, quote, Gilles Routier says uh, the following, which should put us into a real uh, interesting personal discernment. Synodality requires certain attitudes and is the product of certain spirit. It depends a lot on the relational, relational abilities of those who hold official posts and on their ability to position themselves as brothers, sisters, friends, collaborators, and cooperators. So, personal conversion, change of mentalities, conversion of hearts, what we have seen is the base for structural reforms. So if we do not form synodal attitudes, we cannot expect synodality to work in a structure because we do not uh, born already knowing how to listen how to take advice, how to dialogue. It implies a formation of synodal attitudes. At the end, uh, like uh, Routier uh, is putting here, it depends in their ability to position ourselves as brothers, sisters, friends, collaborators, and cooperators. The biggest challenge is then this to open the debate, uh, the conversation. How do we change the ecclesial culture? We are used to be and live and act in a certain way in the church that we sometimes are afraid of changing that uh, way of uh, proceeding. 
Uh, Pope Francis, in another homily, 2015 February, says the following. In which there is following, there can be in our church, following, following of Jesus, without renunciation. There can be prayer without encounter. There can be fraternal life without communion. There can be obedience without trust. And there can be charity without transcendence. If I can invert that, that's synodality. If I can have following of Jesus with renunciation, with giving myself to the other, if I can have prayer with encounter, not without encounter, not that I go to the Mass and then the other is outside uh, the Mass and I don't care about, about prayer with encounter of the other, fraternal life with communion, obedience with trust and charity with transcendence, that's Synodality. What it's at stake with Francis, and that's why we see uh, so much opposition in certain spaces, especially in the US and Spain, is because what it at stake with Francis is the spirit of the Vatican II. Many people say that it's a problem of uh, attacking Francis because he's a Latin American and there is a lot of uh, racism or whatever. That's not the real problem uh, in the attacks against the Pope. It's the rejection or non-reception of the spirit of the council. And therefore, uh, Francis embodies as a son of the council the first Pope that it's putting the council into practice as a son of the council. He did not participate in the council. So he's bringing a reception already, and therefore the church is right now in a transition. All reforms are transitions. And in a transition, we have uh, uh, been experiences what any transition in any institution happens. We don't have to be afraid of oppositions, we don't have to be afraid of confrontations that are happening. That's a, a experience of all the transitions, all the institutions. But what it, uh, it uh, at stake is precisely the council, not a Latin American way of being church. A church that is faithful to the Vatican Second Council or not. Thank you so much. Yes. What are the implications of this vision, synodality, to relations with non-Christians? Yeah, That's, um, we, we just saw this uh, document about fraternity, which embodies this uh, sense of um, a synodal church that wants to also listen and take advice and construct a community with other religions. I guess that's part of, of a fundamental part. And in our context, at least uh, where many of us live, we share uh, spaces with different people from different religions. So if I do not learn how to listen and they express their faith through their own languages and ways of being, and I do not learn how to interpret that and approach to that reality and become Proxim, proxim to that reality, it's not uh, a synodal way of proceeding then. No? So that church that before the council thought that had a salvation only for Catholics, that after the council salvation is outside the church, not within the, the walls of the church, has to uh, understand that uh, the relationship with the other, the others in the other's religions is fundamental to my own a salvation is not additional. It's not an, an, a something that I add up. No. Okay. Yes. What would you say to people who think that the church doesn't need to be reformed, but like when they say renew, they mean continue in the same tradition because they fear the change or loss of ancient historical whatever they want to call it. Yeah, I think it's normal to have uh, fears because if I have grown for 30 years or 40 years in a certain way of uh, proceeding in the church and now it seems like everything is uh, changing to another way and I'm not used to it, 
So that's normal in any uh, change, personal, structurally, institutionally, in society. But at the same time is to understand that if my center is following Jesus, and I go to a simple text in the Gospels, where uh, the other, which is my brother, sister, friend, neighbor, is the central um, uh, aspect in my life as Christian, that has to change my life in the church. So sometimes it's a matter if we have read the Gospels or not, and, or if we just have been raised by a catechism. And it's not that we don't have to read catechism. What I'm saying is what has been central in my faith life throughout my life. I wrote uh, my Christology book, is, the title is Return to Jesus. And I wrote it the first years of Francis Pontificate, putting that title because I truly believe that the key is to return to Jesus. And return to Jesus is not a fundamentalistic approach, it's reading the Gospels. So I, I, a person, I have these gospel reading groups, and, and in, uh, in one that has half of the group is Catholic, half of the group is, uh, come from different Protestant uh, denominations, and one Protestant, uh, one Catholic woman said to the Protestant, I grew up with the catechisms, and you're teaching me the gospels. That's beautiful. To recognize that sometimes it's not a problem of uh, resistance is sometimes that we just have to go to the Gospels again and let the Gospels live in us. Yes? Just to follow up on that, like, I think, do you think that the, the, the given the history of colonialism and the role the Catholic Church played like, historically but also currently in sort of defining cultures in Latin America, do you think that there's sort of an inability for them to reckon now with what their history has been and sort of the idea that they were bringing the truth to the Americas, and now the Americas are bringing the truth to them. Like, do you think that's an ability out there? Well, uh, we, we have an expression in, in Latin American uh, church uh, the, that came in the first years of Francis Pontificate, Latin America as a source church. Source church doesn't mean that we have the model, the perfect model of being church, and now Francis is going to bring it to the whole world. It's about the way in which the church in Latin America has been growing as church and, and, and functioning as church. And that has to do with what I said of this pastoral de conjunto, this way of thinking us together in an interwoven uh, way of understanding personal and structural relationships. That doesn't happen in any other um, church in the world. And this is something interesting because it's cultural. Uh, when we do theology, uh, uh, in any of our uh, faculties, uh, you just have to ask if I am used to work with others or if I'm used to work alone. That's cultural. So in the way in which we understand the church, that working together is normal. So when we say this Latin American as a source church has to do with this style, with this way of proceeding, uh, with this uh, way of becoming a source church, I mean a, a, a way of being, being church, that is not simply um, going to a parish. The way of being, of interacting, of constructing, you know, that's important. Just, uh, with regard to that question of listening to the, the, the culture and, and learning from it, um, I had gotten into a conversation uh, not long ago with, with uh, a pastoral theologian from Germany, and I was talking about theology of the people, and he was talking about something else, um, and resisting the, the whole notion of theology of the people because it didn't belong in Germany. It belongs in Latin America, and his his way of thinking about you know we, we we both think a lot about parishes. His way of thinking about parish is um, almost like a consumer product. We want to keep the customer satisfied, so we need to start listening to what the people want, what they need, and reform the parish according to you know what they're looking for. Yeah. Um, 
I didn't really know what to do with that. <laughs> what would you do with it? <laughs> well, and the, um, the, the book uh, that I wrote about Francis is called Theology of the People, not because of the Argentinian theology of the people. I explained that there, but it's not about that. It's about the theology of the people of God. So what means to be people? What means to be church? Um, and the, the, uh, even though that German theologian was against, the Germans, the war folk, has very much to do with the uh, Spanish war people, because has this common subject. Um, and in the time, uh, this romanticism of the war where it was created has to do a lot with uh, our cultural way of understanding people. But the thing is that Francis is not bringing a theology, theology of, or liberation, theology or theology of the people. He's not bringing a way of uh, being church from Latin America. That's the way he receives the church. That's the way he has lived the church, so he cannot take that away from him. But when he starts to go further of the council's spirit and integrates all the cultures, and for example, the, car, the College of Cardinals right now represents practically the whole universal church, not only the Europeans. So that, that's a change uh, in this around the world people. If people means diversity, how can I translate that into the structures of a parish, for example? I, I really uh, sometimes feel uncomfortable when I go to a parish and I see like the first floor, the English, the, the basement, the Spanish, and I don't know, the third floor in uh, uh, Chinese. No? I mean, where is the community? Where is the interwoven relationship in which we are saved and therefore where, where is that that makes us be persons, not uh, bubbles? No? So it's a challenge. If people, it's all the people in a parish that has to be manifested too, or in any place. No? So I guess that is a, a, a cultural, sometimes, problem of understanding um, that notion that uh, makes difficult to understand the council in that same notion more than, than bad or intentions or bad willing. No? But it does happen any, any, a lot, a lot, yeah. With Francis, I mean, yes. Can you talk about, in really practical terms, so for example, at a lot of um, Catholic churches, you might see a mass in Spanish at 5 p.m. and then English language masses, but how do you, um, how do you on one hand respect uh, what you said about the right to, not the right, but the, um, being able to understand your faith in your own language, your native language, with this idea of interweaving without imposing, again, to go back to the colonial question, like English yeah. is the dominant language because we're in the United States, yes. and creating a welcoming community. Yes, I think you, we have to have the two realities. Sometimes the mass in Spanish, because of that, there is a cultural identity, there is uh, in, at least in Hispanic immigrants, uh, normally what they do first when they come here is to go to a church because they feel their community, because they're living family. So that first, uh, let's say, a movement towards uh, looking at church has to do with an identity. But at the same time, I have to create spaces of interaction between the different cultures in that parish. So I need the two things working together, not only the um, uh, separation of languages I in a community. How can we do that? That's the challenge, you know? But it's not about uh, having a mass in half Spanish and half English, neither. As is, it's not about having a mass in Spanish in the basement and in English in the first floor. It's how do I have uh, spaces where Spanish or any other language are spoken because it represents identity in the way we speak, etc., and also spaces in which we can all interact and get to know each other and share within that diversity. So I guess the combination of a model here, it's a task, it's a challenge. Uh, and, and this is, for me, challenging uh, in the U.S. because here in Boston, the office for Hispanic ministry was closed to, uh, the next year that I came here. 
I helped during the first year with some courses, and then they decided to shut it off, to close it. And, re and for my surprise, I thought the Boston was a place where 90% uh, were um, uh, white Americans. That was my idea before coming to Boston. And when I started to go to the peripheries of the city, we got millions of people or Portuguese or Hispanic speaking communities. Not hundreds, thousands, more than a million. So how can you then not have a, 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 the sense that that's the need, the reality, and that's the church? So that, that I get your question is very important because of, of that. I mean, we don't have a model. And that's why uh, at, at least many people that I know from the Hispanic communities are living to the Protestant churches. In my, in, my, in my street where I live today, I was uh, walking, and they're renewing a, a house. These are all busy houses where several international professors live there, and they bought a house to renew it. And all the workers are Hispanic, but you know what one of them had? A big speaker with a preacher of his church, very high, very loud. So the other two workers were hearing the preacher of the... And then I started to speak with this person, and what he said is that, you know, I found here what I didn't find in the Catholic Church. So I bring it with me everywhere. So again, identity, culture, find a community, find something that supports you. So that's something that, at least in where I am in Boston, is a challenge because it's not getting a response of the church. Thank you so much. <laughs>